Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, I post videos pertaining to a little bit of whatever I want, conspiracy theories, true crime, vlogs, and all things spooky, scary, skeletons. So if you're into any of that, you can subscribe and if not, no hard feelings, like don't feel pressured. We're just here to, you know, talk about some true crime. For those who noticed, I dyed and cut my hair. It's like a dark red. I don't remember what dye I used though. So I know I used a 10 developer, but I don't know the brand or anything of the dye that I used. I feel like Ariana Grande. Do you guys hear music? I think there's like music going on. Up. Did someone say cheap flights? That is hilarious because literally no one was Great talking to hear about that. It. I think I have a solution for you. Hi, I like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Hopper. If you don't know what Hopper is, Hopper is a free traveling app that is available on iOS and Android and helps over 70 million travelers get the best and cheapest prices on hotels, car rentals, flights. Hopper is so, so easy to use with their app. All you really need to do is go to their main screen, click on flights, and if I wanted to, for example, go to Hawaii, Hopper will give me the dates that are best to go go to Hawaii so it's looking like April and May and how you can tell is through their color coding system so the greens are the best dates to go while the orange and red is more expensive. Also have this wonderful option watch this trip. For example if I want to go to Milan I'm like yes let's go oh my god that is a little bit too expensive for me. I can easily click on watch this trip and then from that Hopper will monitor this price 24-7 and send me any notifications if the price goes down. So no matter when you decide to book your trip, you know for a fact you're always gonna get the best deal. And then when the time is convenient, you can safely and securely book your trip within the app. Hopper also has price prediction with a 95% accuracy that saves users on average about $65 per trip. With Hopper's flexible date plan, it gives you the flexibility to change your flight, the time, and your airline for absolutely any reason up to 24 hours prior prior to your scheduled departure time. And don't even stress again, because there are still no added fees. Hopper also offers carrot cash that allows you to triple dip your trips while adding credit back onto your Hopper, all whilst, you know, adding up your traveling miles and getting your credit card points on top of all of that. Now I know you're probably, you know, flabbergasted, you're freaking out, you're like, oh my God, where do I get Hopper? Calm down because it's all in the description box below. And the people who do click the link down below will automatically receive $20 in carrot cash through the app to go towards your very first flight and hotel within the app. I've actually had a really, really good experience with Hopper recently on Valentine's Day. I decided to give my sister and her fiance a little Valentine's getaway. Using Hopper during this whole experience was so easy. As I said, like the color coding system is honestly a lifesaver. Everything was super simple and laid out. There was nothing complicated or confusing about it. Contrary to a lot of the other sites that I've used, Hopper is by far the best one I've ever used. Honestly, I don't think I'll ever go back because booking travel is cheaper on Hopper. And again, if you also want Hopper, all you need to do is click the link down below to download their app. And when you use the link down below, you will automatically get a $20 credit within the app to go towards your very first flight and hotel. Again, thank you to Hopper for sponsoring today's video. That's it for me. Back to you, Haley, in the studio. I think that's all I need to say. But without further ado, let's hop right into the video. Anu Singh was born on September 3rd of 1972 in India until she was about two years old and that is when her family up and moved to Canberra, Australia. Anu actually came from a pretty wealthy family. Both of her parents were doctors and she was an only child. Her parents said that when Anu was a child, she was very loving, laugh all the time. She was always the star of the show when she was a kid. As she started to get to high school, a lot of people saw her as like annoying so she didn't really have many friends and so since she didn't really have many friends she would tend to like do and say outrageous things in high school to get the other kids attention following in 1995 that is when Anu got into a relationship with this guy named Simon Walsh her and Simon were dating for a while Anu says that they were actually in love with each other until one day Simon had broke off the relationship and it absolutely crushed Anu 
Anu. Anu's father actually said that during this time, she was not like herself. She was crying every single night. She would barely sleep. She kept on telling her dad that she felt like she was going mad. In the same year of 1995, one night, Anu is out on the town, and that is when she meets a guy named Joe Cinque. Joe Cinque was born in Newcastle, Australia. His parents were also immigrants, similar to Anu. His parents, Maria and Nino, had actually moved to Australia all the way from Italy. Joe, growing up, like everyone who met him or knew him, had nothing but great things to say about Joe. He was incredible at sports, more specifically Australian football, which is like American soccer. A really big extrovert. He was always the life of the party at any party he went to. Same thing with his family. His family was also super, super loving. Joe's friends had actually said that every time they would go over to Joe's house, the mother, Joe's mother, would always like cook them Italian dinners and desserts. And every friend and person that walked through the door, Joe's family made sure to make them feel like they were home. And oh my god, why am I gonna cry? Some of these stories are like really, really hard to talk about because these people were clearly so sweet and kind to every single person that they met. Like he clearly was such an amazing person, such an amazing guy. Like all of a sudden there are like terribly scary people in this world that will do scary things. Anyway, <laughs> I'm literally just in the biography. All around, Joe was a really, really amazing person. One night when he was out with his friends, that is when he met Anu. As soon as Anu and Joe met, he was very, very drawn to Anu's confidence. I totally forgot to mention, but Anu went to the Australian National University on a double major for economics and law. Joe was very, very attracted to Anu's intelligence. She was super outgoing. She always talked to everybody that she met. The downside to this relationship is that Joe lived in Newcastle and Anu lived in Canberra, which if you're not familiar, is a four hour drive. Joe went back to Newcastle and Anu remained in Canberra. That did not stop them because they still remained long distance. Although long distance did make things a lot harder for the couple, they still remained very determined to make it work. Shortly after Joe graduated, graduated college with his degree in civil engineering. He actually got a job in his town at a firm. In Newcastle, it seemed like Joe was really getting his life together. He had his family, he had his friends, he had his job, like everything in his life was in Newcastle. Until 1996, about like seven months after Anu and Joe actually met, that's when things in the relationship started to get a little bit more serious. With their relationship, it was very rocky. Joe just kind of thought that the reason why their relationship just wasn't working was because they were long distance. Joe wasn't the only one that felt this really odd presence when it came to Anu because whenever Anu would go over and meet Joe's family, Joe's family said that when they first met Anu, Anu had like a very odd presence to her. She was definitely the center of attention but not in a good way as if like, you know, she was talking to everyone. It seemed like the conversation always had to be about her. She was always the first one to start the conversation. She never really let anyone speak. She would also discuss very odd subjects, like not something that you talk about when meeting your boyfriend's parents for the first time or like his whole family. Started discussing topics like the afterlife and if they believed in an afterlife. She also started to talk about her ex-partner, Simon Walsh, and she said that they were so in love and so attached at the hip. It was actually incestuous how close they were, her and her ex-partner. Again, talking about your ex is not something that you talk about when meeting your boyfriend's family for the first time. So made known that Anu had to have Joe's attention constantly, that even at points like when Joe was just talking to his parents in the kitchen or was just having a conversation that wasn't with Anu, Anu would catch him having a conversation and she would just go up to him and start hugging him and kissing him and basically break him away from the conversation to make sure that his attention wasn't on any 
anyone else but hers. It was also said that every single night in the household, they would have dinner at 6 p.m. And Anu knew this, but whilst they were long distance, she would always call at around like 6.10 to 6.15 to make sure that Joe would break away from his family dinner and give all of his attention to Anu. And there was a couple times where the mom even stepped in and took the phone from Joe and was like, Anu, we're eating. We eat every night at 6 p.m. You know this. Don't call until 7 p.m. Like, let the poor boy eat. But she didn't ever really listen to her. She still called and Joe always picked up. Later on that year in 1996, they were dating for almost a, a year now. And that is when Anu started to convince Joe to move his life from Newcastle to Canberra so they could get a house together and move in with each other. Joe, in this situation, as I was talking about earlier, he felt like the only reason their relationship was the way that it was, was because of the long distance. He felt like, you know, if they weren't long distance, then they would make a great couple and they wouldn't fight as often because they'd always be there for each other. Somehow, Anu was able to convince Joe to move four hours away from his family, his friends and quit his job. When Joe told his parents that he was moving off to Canberra with uh, Anu, his parents were begging him to stay. They really, really didn't want him to leave because first of all, they didn't even really like Anu. And also he was really giving up everything to be with this girl, like his family, his friends. He was super, super close with his family. And now he was gonna be living four hours away from them. Joe in this situation didn't really live listen to anyone and he still moved in with Anu anyway and they found a house in the suburbs of Canberra and decided to live there. Joe was really hoping that maybe with this move it'll improve their relationship a lot better and from the outside like what a lot of people said they said that Anu and him looked very very happy together but in reality things just got so much worse. Anu already had some previous mental illnesses since, you know, Joe wasn't around her 24 seven. He wasn't able to see all of these mental illnesses that she had. When her and Joe actually moved in together, that is when her mental illnesses started to worsen. She was obsessed with like the shock factor. She loved reactions. And so because of this, she was super obsessed with her appearance. So she would be constantly, you know, eating healthy, working out. She was on multiple diets all the time. Since her mental state was like starting to deteriorate, she started to convince herself of a lot of very odd things. She convinced herself that she had AIDS, but then when she went to the doctor, they told her that she didn't have AIDS. She was always freaking out that she was dying and rotting from the inside. She would have a lot of these like episodes where she felt like she was dying, but then 10 minutes later, feel completely better. Joe didn't really know how to handle all of this. And same thing with Anu's parents. Anu's parents actually tried to get her help multiple times, but Anu refused the help and she just, you know, kept on saying that she was fine. Well, because of this, it was really hard for Joe to continue living with Anu. She wasn't accepting any of the help that he gave her either. Over time, Joe just grew very, very tired of Anu in general. He he grew tired of her attitude, her constant need for attention. It was always her talking in every single conversation that they had and every fight that they had, it was always Joe's fault and never on news. And that is when he started to think more about his future and his future plans. And those future plans did not include Anu. And then later on in 1997, so about a year after they moved in with each other, Joe started to slowly distance himself from Anu. He didn't really give her as much attention as he used to. He would not put up with any of the stuff that she was doing. Around this time, he actually bought himself a new car. And now this car was a very sporty sort of car. It wasn't the type of car that you have, like if you're planning to be parents or something in the future, it was more a car for himself. Anu kind of got the hint from this. She started to notice how he was starting to distance himself. And also with the new car, she knew that sooner or later, he was not going 
going to need her anymore and end up leaving. When she started putting the pieces together that he was planning on leaving, she decided to come up with this suicide pact. What the suicide pact was gonna be, her plan was that she was going to throw a big party. And after this party, when her and Joe lay down to go to sleep, she was going to lace his drink and her drink so that they would both die in their sleep and die together. That was her plan. That's what she planned on doing. Now the actual was not how it was supposed to go. Something like this, a suicide pact because you need drugs, a whole plan. And at the time, Anu really didn't have many friends, but she did have this one friend named Mahavi Rao. I think that's how you pronounce her name. She explains this whole plan to her friend. This is what I plan on doing. I just don't know how to do it. And for some reason, her friend doesn't snap Anu out of it and say, no, you're not going to kill him, but instead encourages it and helps her perform it. They together started to go to the library and check up a bunch of books on basically like how to commit suicide. And they actually like took a class too on how to inject medicine into someone. They started to construct this whole plan. And since Anu had no friends and Madhavi did, not only in charge of just getting the drugs, but she was also in charge of getting all of the friends to come to this party. What Anu had in in mind is that she wanted this entire dramatic scene. She wanted to plan out this whole entire evening. This is how, you know, her and Madhavi saw it going. She was going to throw a dinner party and Madhavi was going to bring the guest list. Everyone at the party was going to know what was going on. They were going to know that this was a farewell party to Anu and Joe and everyone would know this this except for Joe. Later on that night afterwards would drug Joe with Rifenol, I think it's pronounced. It's a drug. It's basically like a sleeping drug. It's actually illegal in the United States because it's just extremely heavy. Cocaine users actually use it to lessen the symptoms of the cocaine. So this is like how strong this drug was. On October 20th of 1997, that is when Madhavi had found a group of people and this is so insane to me. Every single person that came to this party was aware that Anu planned on killing herself and Joe as part of a suicide pact. And they also knew that Joe was not aware of the suicide pact. Yet the entire dinner party, laughing, they were telling jokes, they were having a great time, yet no one said a single thing thing or try to stop it at all. Everyone just collectively thought that this was okay. Joe was at his farewell party and he was the only one that didn't know about it. Just so surreal to imagine these people at this dinner party and they know that Anu is going to kill Joe. It's so disgusting that not a single person woke up and realized what was going on. And it wasn't even Anu in her own head, she had all these people around her that also thought it was okay. So that kind of fueled Anu's beliefs into thinking that this was okay. These weren't like dumb friends that she found. These were all law students, similar to Madhavi because Madhavi and Anu met when Anu was majoring in law. All of Madhavi's friends were in law school, super smart, getting their masters and PhD. So these weren't dumb people. These were really, really smart individuals, yet none of them had the common sense to stop what was happening or even go to the police or let Joe know to leave. As far as Joe, Joe just kind of believed that this party was just a regular dinner party. Some people actually knew that Anu was serious about this, while other people just kind of assumed that she was being dramatic or she was joking about it. Oh, it was Rihypnol. 
that's how you pronounce it. Madhavi had given Rihypnol to Anu and basically told her to slip this in his drink, do two to three tablets, and he should be knocked out. That night, after all the friends left, they said their goodbyes. Anu made some coffee for Joe, and in his coffee, she put two tablets of this Rihypnol. And then once he drank it all up, he went to bed and he was completely unconscious. And that is when she starts to distribute heroin into his bloodstream. This first time, she wasn't able to distribute the heroin properly. There was a lot of like mistakes in the preparation of it. So due to this, she wasn't able to actually put any heroin into him. Next morning, he woke up and he was fine. He just felt like he had a really bad hangover. That following Friday on October 24th of 1997, that is when Anu, since she wasn't able to kill Joe the first time, she hosts a second dinner party and she just tells Joe, our friends really enjoyed our dinner party last time and we're thinking about having another one here. So then for the second time, the same exact people come over, recreate the same exact farewell party for Joe. And again, Joe does not know what is going on. If they felt like she was joking, why would they come over for a second dinner party with Anu telling them, yeah, we need to do another dinner party because the first one, I didn't kill him properly. People knew at this point that Anu wasn't joking, that she actually was trying to kill Joe, but same exact routine with the first dinner party. No one intervened, no one stepped in, no one said anything. They all just enjoyed themselves. They ate, they danced, they laughed. Later on that night, Anu tries at attempt number two to kill Joe. After the party, she gives him his Rihypnol two tablets in his coffee. Once he is knocked out in bed, that is when she properly prepares the heroin and gives him two extremely heavy doses of heroin into his bloodstream. He woke up the next morning and he was still alive, but he was barely clinging on. And over the next two days, Anu basically just watched Joe die. She watched him as he was on his last leg. She watched him as as he was asking to go to the hospital. She watched all of that for two days straight and not a single moment did she have the realization, what am I doing or maybe I should help him. She didn't even leave the house and let him die on his own. She watched him die for two days, a terrible, miserable, slow death. October 26th of 1997, that is when Anu realizes Joe is actually starting to die now. So she calls not the paramedics or the police, but she instead calls her friend. She calls her friend in a panic saying Joe is dying of a heroin overdose and she doesn't know what to do. I just want to mention that this is not the friend that showed up to the party. This is just a random friend that she decided to call. And when the friend was like, why are you calling me? You should be calling an ambulance. Anu kept on saying like, no, I can't call the ambulance. I can't call the police. I don't want to call the police. And then this is what the friend says in response to Anu saying that. The friend on the phone basically told Anu that she was a selfish be. Call an ambulance because it's either your boyfriend survives and you just have to live with an angry boyfriend or you go to jail for murder. And so with this, Anu kind of snapped back into reality and she called the ambulance. Now, when she called the ambulance, it was a very odd phone call because at times in the phone call, she was super calm and collected, but then just like two sentences later, she was screaming and panicking and freaking out. She at first gave them a fake address and even gave them a fake name. She said that her name was Olivia and not Anu. Eventually, after a while, she gave them the real address. The paramedics enter the room. They see Joe naked on the floor with this brown liquid coming out of his mouth. And the paramedics try their hardest to try to save him, but because of this brown liquid in his mouth, they weren't able to get to his 
his airway and try to get out any obstructions. So then, unfortunately, later on that afternoon, that is when paramedics declare Joe to be dead. Paramedics in this situation kept on saying that even Anu was just as all over the place in person as she was on the phone. She was like pacing back and forth. Every time she was crying, she wasn't even really crying. There was no tears. She was just making the noises of crying. And then she would look around to see if anybody was looking at her. This specific paramedic was like interviewed about this whole situation. And the paramedic said that there were a few times where Anu would grab on to like the paramedic's arms and shake them and ask them if he was going to be okay. When the police got involved into this, the police were very, very confused at what happened to Joe exactly because how is it that a young, fit, smart man with no drug history whatsoever from family and friends says that he was very, very against drugs all of the sudden die of a heroin overdose. Police automatically think that this is really odd, so they take in uh, Anu for questioning to get a little bit more information on how Joe was the past following days, how the parents found out about all of this, Joe's parents, is that every single Sunday, Joe would call his parents and they would all like sit down and have a conversation and he would basically just catch up his parents on what happened that week, his parents would catch Catch him up on what happened that week. It was just their weekly ritual until one Sunday, Joe did not call. So then the parents just kind of assumed that maybe he was busy with something. Five o'clock, and that is when the mother decided to call Joe. And when she called, it was a police officer that picked up. And when the police officer was on the phone with the parents, around the same time, that is when the mother received a knock at her door and at her door was a police officer. The police officers told the parents to sit down. And when they did, they said that it was about her son. And as soon as the police officer said that, she just screamed out the words, she killed him. Even prior to knowing what actually happened, the parents already knew that Anu had definitely done something to him. The following day, the family had to come all the way out from Newcastle to Canberra to identify Joe's body. Maria and Nino, Joe's parents, as well as Joe's godson and a few other family members came out and they had identified the body of Joe. This was very, very traumatic for the mother. They actually went to the police station, the headquarters federal police station, told told the family that this was not a suicide because at first they were suspecting a heroin overdose due to the amount of heroin in his body, but after realizing that he had no history with drug abuse, they more just saw this as a murder or possibly something with Anu, but it was definitely not a suicide. From the like pattern of the injections, it didn't look like Joe had done it himself. It more looked like someone else had done it to him. When Anu was in the police station, there she was wearing a white nightgown during this time she was also super frantic she was constantly moving around she was looking around all the time as if she was nervous she was in the police station only for a little bit until she just started to rat herself out because the police clearly knew what happened they just wanted to hear the full story a lot of the investigators throughout this as well noticed that every time Anu would cry simply similar to what the paramedics had said, there was absolutely no tears. Actually, one investigator that said that Anu would cover up her face and kind of put like her shoulders up and down as if she was kind of like sobbing. And then she would look like around, like in between her fingers, she would kind of look around with absolutely no tears and just seeing if people were looking at her, just moving her shoulders up and down as if she was crying. This was really, really odd to this particular investigator because it just made her think this woman doesn't even care about what she did. She doesn't understand the severity of what she did. She is living in her own drama scene. So then she confesses to the police and tells them this whole entire suicide story pact. As I said, and you're probably like wondering as well, if this was a suicide pact between Anu and Joe, 
why didn't Anu kill herself as well? This was a very pressing question for the police because they just genuinely wanted to know, was this suicide pact just a cover-up so that you could kill Joe? Even to this day, the police never got a satisfactory answer from Anu. She basically just deflected it or she blamed it on other things. She also said that Joe got her addicted to this weight loss drug called Epicac and then Epicac ended up like messing with her head a lot. That it was a contributing factor as to like why she felt like she needed to kill Joe. The investigators were also confused on the motive of the reasoning. Dropping in again just to let you know that Joe's family has done interviews like now talking about this whole Epicac theory. They do not believe Anu when she says that Joe suggested Epicac. Because as I said earlier, Joe was not onto drugs. He was very against drugs and so the fact that he would even know what Epicac was, it's very unlikely. And Epicac is that it's supposed to induce vomiting. It's not even supposed to be a weight loss drug. It's supposed to help you vomit like if you've had poison or something. So the fact that he would, one, know what that was and try to like tell her to take it, it's very unbelievable. So the family says that they do not believe when Anu said that. They were thinking that maybe Anu was just trying to think of things to make herself look innocent or to make herself look like she had a good reason for doing what she did. They were like talking to her, asking her all these questions about how she got the drugs and where did it come from. That is when Anu brings up her friend Madhavi into the situation and Madhavi was also brought into the station for questioning. Madhavi basically just owned up to it. She didn't try to hide anything. She didn't try to preach innocence. She felt like, you know, they're gonna know anyway. So I might as well just save myself some time here. So Madhavi ended up getting a lawyer and she said that she did indeed buy those drugs, but she didn't actually think that Anu was going to go through with it. Even if you don't think she's going to go through with it, why would you even buy them in the first place? Like it just seemed she was just as in on the plan as Anu was, except Anu executed the plan. Like Madhavi was clearly an accomplice. She gave the ingredients that Anu needed for this murder to Anu and obviously when you give a murderer a knife they're gonna kill someone with it you know like in the following year of October 1998 that is when Anu and Madhavi actually stood trial together until about three weeks when they didn't stand trial together anymore because of illegal technicalities so then because of that they were both given separate trials and with these separate trials both of them requested a judge only trial because what jury is going to look at them and find sympathy. During the trial, Anu chose to not give any sort of evidence to the court because I don't know why. She basically said that in her defense, her mental health was at an all-time low, said that she would frequently have like depressive episodes. She was just basically saying that she had a lot of mental issues and that is why she did what she did. She was just pleading for insanity so that she didn't actually have to go to prison. Now, now, it was made known in Madhavi's trial that whilst Madhavi was talking to Anu, Anu actually said the words to Madhavi. Since she had a lot of knowledge about psychology and the law, it wouldn't be hard for her to fake insanity because she knew exactly what the lawyers were looking for when it came to deeming if someone was insane or not. There are millions of people who have very serious mental health issues issues and a lot of them don't kill other people and they don't watch people die for two days. Just had absolutely no heart in this situation. Anu took months and months to create this plan. It was very long and detailed, something that needed a lot of knowledge, work, and preparation. Typically, like in these situations, you would sort of lose interest quite easily if it wasn't important to you, but in this situation, it was was important.
important to Anu that in months and months of preparation, she continue to follow through with it. The investigators also interrogated a bunch of the people that entered these parties with the suspicion that maybe they were involved or even helped. And all of the people at this party, they told the police that they knew what was going on. They knew that at the end of the night, Anu was going to kill Joe, but they also thought that Anu was going to kill herself as well. They didn't think that Anu would still be alive, but just the fact that they knew, they knew that Anu was gonna kill Joe. They knew that this was a thing going on. They knew by the second dinner party that Anu wasn't successful this first time. And so she was going to be successful the second time. Even to this day, like the police have no clue why these people never stepped in, why they never said anything to Joe, why they had this dinner farewell party to Joe and Joe was the only one that didn't know. Unfortunately, the friends that showed up to this party was never taken into trial at all. I personally feel like all of the people who knew about the crime, they should be charged as well. You know, they were also accomplices. April 23rd of 1999, that is when Anu was charged with the manslaughter of Joe Chinque. And as for Madhavi, Madhavi just got to walk away free even though she bought the drugs, she handed the drugs to Anu. Anu could not have completed this crime without her. Just walked away free as if she didn't do anything. A lot of the people that were, you know, like keeping up with this case, they felt like it was extremely unfair. Anu was just as responsible as Madhavi was, but in this situation, Madhavi was just being able to walk away free. Anu got charged with manslaughter and her sentence was 10 years prison plus four years non-parole which I don't know if we have that in the states because I've never heard of that before technically like she would serve her 10 years but she would only be serving four of them in prison because the remaining six years she would be on parole as in like Anu's defensive team basically said that since at the time of the crime she was extremely mentally ill it was diminished responsibility so that means she wasn't in the right mind state, she technically is not as guilty because it wasn't her fault. Court felt like even though she was mentally ill, they truly did feel like after hours and hours of talking to her and looking through all of the evidence of the crime, they felt like this sort of crime would have been committed, maybe not as brutal, but even if she wasn't mentally ill, this probably still would have happened. The motive or suspected motive of all of this was was because Joe bought his car and that was kind of a indication that he was starting to build a life of his own and he was starting to, you know, move forward with his life and his future and Anu didn't want him to leave her. So instead of him leaving her, she just killed him. Anu, she was supposed to serve 10 years plus four years parole if, you know, like only if. She ended up only serving for brutally murdering her boyfriend. She only ended up serving 18 months for this crime. She served 18 months. And while she was in prison, she finished off her PhD. She also wrote her thesis. Her thesis was basically on women who commit crimes in the legal system and how messed up it is in Australia. Now this case was really big in Australia. And during this time, once it was found out that she was only released after 18 months, they were protesting to put her back in jail. But you know, what's done is done. She can't really go back because people are yelling at the police to put her back. The parents especially were very, very angry at this because the mother actually said in an interview once before, whenever a dog does something as like biting a mailman or something, that dog is immediately put down and put to rest by animal control. But when a human kills another human, 
that human just gets to roam around the world freely. They thought it was not fair that not only did Madhavi not get any time at all and neither did any of the friends that were there. Anu got her time but she only served a little over a year when she was supposed to serve 10. The reasoning of why Madhavi was acquitted was because they said that there wasn't enough evidence to pinpoint Madhavi at the crime itself. They said that since she wasn't the one distributing the heroin, she wasn't the one actually killing Joe because without Anu there would be no crime but at the same time if there were no Madhavi there also would be no crime. As I said while Anu was in prison she actually completed her thesis and it was called Offending Women, A Greater Understanding of Female Criminality in Australia. Her thesis on women who commit crimes and how they are discriminated against when it comes to offending women and offending men. The thesis itself is actually not available to the public online. You actually need to attend the University of Sydney in order to access it. There are a bunch of sites that like hold little excerpts of it, but that's really it. You can't really access it anywhere else unless you have access to it some way. As for Anu now, she got her PhD in philosophy. She currently lives in New South Wales, living her life, walking the streets, driving in her car, meeting new people every day. Like she is living her life as if she just never killed anyone and destroyed an entire family in the process. In 2017, Nino, the father, actually passed away. Maria, since then, had not really, like, spoken out about this anymore. I think it's because she just lost her son and now she lost her husband. I hope that she is trying to find peace. I just hope that she is surrounded by loving people and she has company all the time because she deserves the world for what she's been through. But yeah, so that is basically the story of Joe Chinkwe. If you guys found this story interesting, you can give it a like and subscribe. And if you want to follow me on any of my social medias, like my Instagram, that will be linked down below, as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything, and as well as well all of the makeup that I put on my face. So if you're wondering what is that shadow, what is that lip, that will be all linked down below. This this was a really heavy one. When you're dealing with someone's like life and trauma, it's very hard to kind of see these things as real life, you know? It's just, it's so surreal. You're hosting a dinner party and it's your farewell party, like your going away party, except everybody at the party knows that you're gonna die tonight, except for you. That's so terrifying. I think that she did deserve a life sentence for what she did. It's not fair that she completely wrecked an entire family and like give them trauma and have them lose their son and have them have to live with this for the rest of their life without their son and she just gets to walk the streets free and meet other people and have and enjoy life. Like that's not fair at all. I don't really know what else to say. I like to end my videos off on like a casual note because as I said, these videos can get a little heavy and I don't want you walking away from this video super sad or anything. I want you guys to walk away from this video knowing Joe's story and knowing what happened to him and being aware of what happened to him because that's the main motive of these videos videos is to just spread awareness on all of these people's stories and allow their legacies to live on. As I said in the beginning of the video, I dyed my hair. I got inspired by literally nothing. Well, the haircut is inspired by Topanga from Boy Meets World. I really liked her hair and like Jennifer Aniston from Friends. I feel like I'm sort of a part of a 70s movie. I'm in the process of building. Do you want to see it? this friend's lego set remember when i tried to show you guys and then my camera died perfect timing all i've built so far was the base i built this yesterday i'm halfway done with season two of hunter x hunter i mentioned that last week anime is so cool and like once i started actually appreciating it because i was like how can i appreciate comic books but i can't appreciate anime once i got with it 
I got with it. I watched this one anime movie a couple days ago. I forgot what it's called. Basically, it's about this little girl. Her parents die and she is put into the custody of her grandmother who owns this hotel. In this hotel, she finds a ghost boy there that actually died at the hotel. Through this ghost boy, he teaches her about grief and how to accept the death of her parents and basically become her best friend in her healing process. It's such, such a cute and good movie. I totally recommend it and I wish I remembered the name of it. I really want to release a comic book in the future, a YouTuber book, but not like a typical YouTuber book because I feel like everyone's YouTuber books are either tutorials or like self-help. I want to actually make a book, like a book with a storyline that has nothing really to do with me, but the hard part is pulling it off because, you know, anyone can make a comic book, but if you are kind of like me and you have a big audience, an audience that does a lot of this stuff or reads a lot of this stuff like you do, they kind of expect the best. So I don't know. I, I'm really hoping that in the future I can do something and pull it off somehow. And if I can't, Oh well. Like we'll just we'll try again until we get it right. Um I think that's all I need to say. So again, thank you to Hopper for sponsoring today's video and I really hope you guys enjoyed this one. So have a wonderful rest of your day. I will see you guys next week and do something that makes you happy today. <laughs>